So the theme of this year's Hadoop world is uh, learning the tools and techniques that make data work. And I thought that what I would do is uh, start out with an example of a place where data did not work. So in a recent prospect of ours, in their data warehousing environment, we found that 1.7% of their queries resulted in a uh, consumption of 65% of their overall data warehouse capacity. Now, these queries weren't actually end user queries, but these were instead queries that were processing data or doing ETL or ELT processing inside the data warehouse. And we found out that that was about five times as expensive as doing it outside of the data warehouse. At the same time, we found out that 97% of their schemas and 80% of their tables overall were unused in the system. And their single biggest table, 2 billion rows, which was being actively appended to every night, was completely but unused by any application. So you're probably saying to yourself, you know, these people were clearly idiots. We would never you know, re replicate something like that. But I'm here to tell you that these people were just like you and me. They started out with really good intentions, and something got away from them in the process. And what I think what happened was that on the march to stamp you know, data scientists onto all of our business cards, we forgot to put the science into a lot of what we were doing. There's been a lot of focus on the discovery piece and the analytics, and there's been really little attention being paid to the reproduction of results, the transparency and the trust in the information that's coming out of Hadoop and traditional data warehousing systems. So let me just give you a quick uh, kind of architectural diagram. When you look at a diagram like this, this is actually a very highly simplified version of what we see in most of our customers. They typically have dozens of types of sources and hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of unique instances of those sources. And you start doing the addition here and start saying, hey, how do I get a, even a single byte of information out the other side of this thing? And you start thinking about all the skills and all the developers that have to work together to get that done mainframe skills, information about message queues, information about you know, which of the 100,000 SAP tables you need to access in order to get those metrics, all with convenient four-letter German acronyms for your convenience. You have to know PLSQL, you have to know MapReduce, you have to know PIG, you have to know Rex code, you have to know C++, you have to know ABAP, you know, the list goes on and on all coordinated into this very delicate you know, data ballet in order to get you know, the information out the other side. Uh, this is New York City, so you have to class it up a little bit. It's a ballet. It's lucky that we even get that bite of information out the other side once, and then we have this problem of reproduction. How are we going to do it over and over again reliably? And not to go all Mark Benny off on you, uh, but I think the solution to this is actually, rather than looking for the you know, kind of one programming language to rule them all, uh, we're actually looking at no-code environments, which is something that Informatica has been investing in for the last like 15 or so years. And the way no-coding environments work uh, is that you want to abstract what you're trying to do from what actually needs to be executed come runtime so that you can take a developer that's familiar with any part of this diagram, teach them a single tool set, and make them productive in any other part of that diagram. Because you can abstract away you know, all the semantics of running on the mainframe, how you run an SMP or MPP or Hadoop or pushing logic down into individual uh, data warehouses, without having to learn all of the different you know, languages and all the different technologies there. So you future-proof your solution by doing this abstraction, because we can rewrite that plan and run it anywhere. You bring more developers to bear uh, on the problem, and you get this automatic uh, reproducibility of your results. And if there's a problem anywhere, you have a single place where all the errors are logged, a single place to debug. And if you discover some piece of information later and you're wondering why it's there, you can go back and look at the metadata, and it'll tell you exactly why it's there and what metrics were actually dependent on that piece of information. And this is kind of critically important because at the end of it, we want to democratize the information that's coming out of these Hadoop systems. You know, it's not enough to just produce that one single epiphany that comes out of Hadoop. But again, we want this information to be consumed broadly by large numbers of users. And I'm here to tell you that every single piece of information that's ever come out of any analytics system in any of our customers gets a ton of scrutiny. Where did it come from? 
who updated it, when was it last updated, what does it actually mean, can I trust it? You can rattle off you know, five to 20 questions without even thinking hard about the problem, and every piece of information that comes out of one of these analytic environments gets that type of scrutiny. And if you can't answer those questions, the data quickly gets into the, goes into the graveyard. This metadata-driven approach, however, gives you that transparency and gives you that trust. It gives you full instrumentation at every step of the integration process. If anything changes, you know immediately what the impact is. If somebody asks where it came from or what it means, you can answer immediately. Don't just take my word for it. Uh, I don't have much time here. Uh, go and listen to PayPal this afternoon. They've put this in place. They'll be discussing it partly in their talk. And please come and join us at the Informatica booth. Uh, thank you, and happy Hadooping.